Good afternoon everyone out there on the interwebs. My name is Jared and this is my channel Mazda B3K. Today we're going to take a look at swapping out the thermostat on mine now uh, 2010 Ford Fusion. Doing this because I'm troubleshooting some issues with the cooling system now that we've completed the engine swap. Without further ado, let's get started. It goes without saying that before we start to play with the cooling system, make sure the engine is cold. Cooling system operates when it's working correctly at around 200 degrees Fahrenheit, which isn't quite boiling, but it's pretty close. You will burn your hands if you start trying to play with hot coolant. So don't do that. Wait for the engine to be cold. I've been letting this sit for a few hours and it's not... It's a cold day today, so it's cold. And our target is right there. That water neck that the lower hose there is attached to. There's a pair of 8mm bolts, comes out, thermostat sits right there. This engine sat on a shelf for quite some time, best that we can tell before we swapped it in. So I'm thinking that the thermostat went bad during that time. They tend to do that when they're not sitting in coolant. So to get there, what we're going to need to do is the air box is going to have to come out. This radiator hose, this upper hose, is going to have to be pulled up and out of the way. And then that'll let us have access down there to the water neck so that we can get that out of the way. Get the air box off. Pretty straightforward. Got a pair of clips. This is something my brother added. It actually lets you know <clears throat> when it's time to change out your air filter. <clears throat> Dirty little secret of the industry is that you don't have to change out your air filter with every oil change. In fact, you can go quite some time before you need to change it out. The sensor needs to come out. Let's see if I can get this out. There we go. Alright. And then with that out of the way, you can kind of wiggle jiggle this. There we go. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to loose it up here. That's going to be a flat head. Or an 8 millimeter. You can do that too. This needs to be over here. Magnet tool. Ooh. There we go. Absolutely enormous flathead. This will work. Alright. So we just loosen this guy up. Normally I prefer using a socket, but I gotta um, get my tools back out of my truck. Alright, so we can just kind of Lay that aside. Don't need to disconnect. This is the fresh air return for PCV stuff. We don't need to fool with that. We can leave it there. What do is give this to, to play. This will just come right out. Anyway, I'll take that out of the way just so I don't have to worry about a soggy filter. And uh, I will bring you back once I have the correct tooling to get this off. And then we can get to that. Now, when we pull this off, no matter what we do, you're going to have coolant spilling out of the block. So make sure that you've got some replacement coolant ready or that you're going to recycle your coolant and just drain it out of your catch pan, which mine's in position under the vehicle already. Uh, I don't feel like trying to recycle it because there's some tainted coolant in there, so I have some on the shelf. The easy way to take care of this kind of a spring clamp is to have the right tool. This is a spring clamp plier. This is not the greatest example of these, but it works. So you hook the circle on the tab and then the slot goes in the slot and you give it a good squeeze. And lucky it actually will engage its little locking tab and you can just slide it out of the way 
All right, here's the part where it gets messy. All right, so top hose is off. You see, we're just kind of seeping coolant down. I'm willing to lose a little bit of coolant, not a big deal. Also, if you don't have some bungee cords, go get some. They are super useful for stuff like this. They can be that extra hand that you need to hold something out of the way. So hose is out of the way. Already moved the spring clamp on this one, and now we got to... Okay, that one's a lot easier to move. All right, this one's going to pee some more. Yeah. Transmission says, why? Why are you doing this to me? Anyway, I need my other hand so I can wrap this one in a, a bungee cord, get it out of the way, bring you guys back. All right, after you get the bolts out, you may notice that it doesn't want to move. Give it a tug. There you go. Hmm, yeah, that's kind of what I thought. I think this, oh yeah, see that? See, that's this copper oxidized. So copper doesn't rust per se, because rust is a specific reaction with iron, but it does oxidize. That's why Lady Liberty looks blue-green, even though she's made of copper and her actual color is bronze. So this one rusted, and I am pretty sure it got stuck. It was not behaving. So we're gonna swap that out. Also note if you didn't go ahead, if you didn't purchase one, which I didn't, because this engine's pretty young, so I know the seal will be good. Uh, there's a seal that you'll have to swap onto the, your new thermostat. So if you didn't purchase it, be mindful you gotta swap it. We'll take care of that, put on the new thermostat, and it'll be good. Alright, today's thermostat is a Motorrad, and I paid a significantly more for it because it has a lifetime warranty on it, which is kind of nice. Versus everything else I could find, which had a one year or even just a three month warranty, which no. This is, my wife's gonna be driving this car a lot and I want it to be, it just work. This is the seal I was talking about. It just goes right around the edge of the thermostat. And I wanted to also show the old thermostat here. This is the original, it's a Fomoco, so it's a Motocraft. A little bit better view of that oxidation. See, it's, it's everywhere. So I suspect this guy was not behaving appropriately. All right, so I'm gonna transfer this. Let me take a look at it first, make sure it's Looks similar. Yep, and we have a jiggle valve. That's good. That allows for bleeding, getting air out. And uh, yeah, that looks really nice. You hardly ever see something still made of copper these days. Copper is a, it's a premium. All right, I'll transfer that. We'll be good and. For reference, when you install a thermostat, the spring always goes towards the block. So, in relation to the vehicle, it's going to go in like this. Not like this. Like this. You put it in like this, it's going to be backwards to the flow and it will not work right. So stick it in like this. And if you're curious, if you really want to verify whether or not your thermostat's bad, you could take this and put it in a pot of boiling water and see if it'll open up. Or you could take a torch to it, heat it up, see if it'll open up. I'm not too worried about it. I'm just going to swap it. Okay, back in a minute. All right, so I did two things. Thing number one is I transferred the seal. And then thing number two is I went ahead and squished it into the water neck because it's actually a really snug fit and you got to work on it. So I suggest you do it this way instead of um, trying to put the thermostat in and then put the water neck in over it. So at this point, you're going to want to take it. Make sure you have a screw in hand or a bolt in hand and just put it back on. Tighten her back up. 
I mean, you want this, you don't want to over torque this. It doesn't need to be crazy tight. It needs to be able to hold 16 pounds of pressure, but no more. So don't over torque it, guys. Don't go crazy. Got it right. This should not fight you much at all when you put the neck back on. Also, note because that o ring goes around the thermostat, you do not need RTV. On almost any other vehicle I've worked on, you've needed RTV, but because of that design, you don't need it. I didn't find any when I took it off. I wouldn't add it. I think that O-ring does the job. By the way, I am installing a 180 degree thermostat. That is the Motocraft spec. You may also find 192 degree thermostats available. Those, I believe, are for northern climates. But down here in the south where I live, I'm going with 180. <laughs> Okay, so we've got the hoses back on. We got the spring clamps engaged again. I've given the hoses a tug. They're not going anywhere. Before we put the air intake back on, we need to open up this bleeder and then go ahead and top off the cooling system. The bleeder is a six millimeter hex and it's held in place with red thread locker. Red thread locker will only give up when you heat it. So, if you don't have good heat source, you're going to have to stop at this point and go find one. You can go get a map torch. A heat gun will probably work. I don't think a hair dryer is quite hot enough, but you want to get it hot. And you want to be able to be precise with the heat. So we wound up using a, uh, a torch on top of a propane bottle. You can pick that up at Lowe's, Home Depot, whatever your local equivalent is. Throw some heat on this, get it nice and hot, and break it loose. After you do that, you shouldn't have to uh, heat it up again any further. So I need two hands to break this loose. I'll bring it back. The how this works is your main fill port, which is over here on the overflow bottle, sits higher in altitude than this bleeder. So what we should be able to do is fill at the fill port, and we fill until coolant starts coming out of here. Once that happens, we know that this area of the cooling system is full and we don't need to worry about it. So let me go get some coolant. Let's see here. There we go. Only the finest Supertech Universal Extended Life. Ford does make a specific long life coolant for this engine. But this coolant here should do the job. Get this open. All right, let's see if we can do the clean pour. Sort of. So as you pour, you're gonna wait a minute and see if you get coolant coming out of bleeder over at the water neck. So I'll stop pouring for a second. Let's see what we have. It takes a moment to kind of work its way through. I, we've already done this before whenever I was putting everything back together after initially doing the engine swap. So you give it a minute, hit it again, give it a minute, hit it again until you see coolant coming up and out of the bleeder. At that point, you're good. Just like that. So you're probably saying, why is that orange? Well, initially this block had Ford Long Life Orange coolant in it. but So there's still some of that floating around in there. But here we go. So we're actually, we're spilling a little bit. Let me move my catch container. All right, at this point, you can put your plug back in, like so. And you want to put it on firm, but do not kill it, because you will, the plug is aluminum, and you will strip it. So I did that one-handed, not super crazy. Let's go ahead and cap this off, because remember the entire system is pressurized at 16 
pounds of pressure. So that's good. And we know we're full there. We're full here, most likely. Let me check. If anything, we definitely have enough. Oh yeah, we're good. All right. What's left is to get the air box back on, and then we can do a test fire. Okay, put your air box back on. Remember to reconnect this sensor. And that, that should have been the only one you had to take loose. And give everything a once over, give it a tug, make sure you got it on tight. And we're ready for a test fire. Very good. So let's see here, I believe. I left the key in here. Here, yes, I did. So let's get rid of the cranky crank. Oof. There we go. All right, so I'm going to hook up OBD2 sensor, which shouldn't be too hard. OBD2 reader. Sorry. Okay, we're going to close the door. Yeah, I am aware of that code. That is the fuel filler neck. We're not worried about it. What we are interested in is this guy. This is the temperature as read from the engine coolant temperature sensor. So I'm going to keep an eye on this. What we should see happen is the thermostat should open at 180 degrees. So at around 180, this is suddenly going to get cold and then start building again. We want to make sure that's working correctly. Okay, we are getting close to where the thermostat should be opening. We should see it in the numbers here. And what we can also do is we can check the hoses coming out from the thermostat into the radiator. And we can feel them and see if the thermostat has opened and let uh, heated coolant from the block get back to the radiator to be cooled down. That's reading correctly. Hmm. And the thing about a thermostat is it's still mechanical. There's no electronic control there. So once it gets hot enough, it should just open up and do its thing until it cools down enough that it closes and then it opens up and then closes and it opens and it closes and it opens and it closes over and over and over and over is how it's supposed to work so let's go check out the hoses since I'm not really seeing a temp drop like I thought I would see here off the OBD2 data so let's go check that out All right, we've got our two hoses here. And this top one is cold at the radiator side. And our thermostat hose is also cold. And do mind your fingers, guys. That is a spinning assembly. So the thermostat has not opened up yet. Because if it did, this shouldn't be cold. It should be warm. This is still warming up. But when I reach back here at the radiator side, it's still cold. So. Yeah, thermostat's not opened yet. So it could be that at the engine temp sensor we're seeing 180 plus, but at the uh, where the thermostat is, we're not seeing that yet. 
All right, I never quite saw a temperature drop, but now if you grab this lower radiator hose, it's hot, very hot to the touch, and it's hard, meaning that the thermostat up in the neck there opened up and let hot water flow past it into uh, back down into the radiator. So that's working correctly, which is good. Uh, something else I'm trying to troubleshoot is I'm trying to understand why the fan doesn't seem to be turning on. But that is another video for another day. So I think we have a successful repair. All right, guys, that's going to do it for today. We managed to get our thermostat replaced, and it is working. So I work continues on trying to understand why the fans are not kicking on. In any case, please leave comments, good or constructive. Don't just take a dump on me, but if there's something you didn't like or you have a question, let me know. Please like, share, and subscribe this video. That helps grow the channel so that eventually I can monetize it and get a better camera. And until the next video, I will see you later.